You know, when I, I read the Old Testament, I'm overwhelmed at the intensity of the men of God. I wonder where they get that spiritual authority and where they get this Holy Ghost stamina to do what they did for a prophet to lay for 365 days on his side, warning Jerusalem of coming judgment. 365 days laying on his side. I, I read of these men that fast 40 days and 40 nights. I can't fast three. I, I, I read of men that are so burdened with the burden of God and so incensed against the sin against God's nature that they can pull clumps out of their beard and clumps out of their hair. I, I'm amazed at, at, at men who can weep and cry and mourn for two and three weeks at a time on their face. No food, no water, and mourn and grieve for the heart of God. And I read those stories and I say, God, those are men of another sort. I, I don't know what that's like. And, and, and then the thing that troubles me is that God says that these things have been put in the Word as examples for us upon whom the ends of the world have come. That, that these, these men were men of like passion. There, was, there, was, there were patterns, there was something in them that God did that laid, what caused God to lay His hands on them. Our present generation is probably, the, and, and without a doubt, the most wicked of all times, many more times wicked than, than Sodom, Gomorrah, and Nineveh. If there was ever a time that people, or nations, and churches, and the society needed men of such intensity, it's now. Why would God arbitrarily raise up men, men of another sort who had this passion, who were able to do incredible exploits in understanding the heart of God and showing the heart of God to nations and brought them to repentance through their actions. And I, I say to myself, God, would you arbitrarily, all, all the way from church history, all the way back to Abraham, go all the way back and God would raise up prophets and God would raise up men and raise up women with such an anointing that they would bring the whole society to their knees and back to God. And why would God suddenly at these last days, when we need him more than any other generation, not raise up men and women as such? I think it obligates us now, I'm not speaking just about preachers, but every, every member of every congregation, everyone who calls himself by the name of Jesus Christ, to search the Word of God out and find the patterns, how these men became men of another sort. How, why did God touch them? Why did God anoint them? Why did God use them? Why did their words not fall to the ground? And why were they so marvelously changed by the power of the hand of God? There are no hidden secrets about being touched by God. There are no hidden secrets. You can study the Word of God and find the patterns, find the way in which men were touched by the hand of God and follow that path. I'm not that kind of man, but I, I, I want to be a man of another sort. A, a man touched by the hand of God where even the enemies of the Lord know that there's a spiritual authority and know that there's been something that comes from the throne of God's heart We're considering Ezra first of all the Bible said a man who awakened his entire nation it is said of him he was a man with the hand of God on him Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it to practice it he set his heart. This was a conscious decision. One day he said, I am going to be a man of the word. I'm going to go to the word and I'm going to tremble by it. And I'm going to act on everything I read. And God saw a man who was saturated with his word, who hungered and loved and appreciated the word. This one man prepared his heart to say, I am going to be a man of the word. There's not a person hearing me that cannot do that by a conscious decision. You don't need some Holy Ghost revival. You don't need somebody sitting down putting you under conviction. You take this word in your hand and say, God, as sure as I have the authority to sit and watch television for three hours, I've got the ability, I can make a decision, I can study God's word.
God supernaturally lays his hand on only those who hunger and thirst after his word and do it. God touches those who love his word and who fast and pray according to that word. Did you see the pattern? Into the word, back to fasting and prayer. Getting the burden of the Lord in his mind. There's nothing complicated about it. Setting the heart. Engaging the heart. Preparing the heart. To seek the Lord. If there's any prayer that needs to be prayed in the church of God today, as far as I'm concerned, it is, Lord, teach us to pray. Not, not teach us to want to pray. Teach us to pray. Te teach us what it is. Teach us not the vocabulary, the disposition. Prayer is not an attitude. Not a latitude, an attitude. Prayer is not a position whether you kneel or face the east. Prayer is not a position, it's a disposition. That's why the Apostle Paul says that it, it is possible to get into that place where, where you pray without ceasing, where every moment of your life you're in an attitude of relationship to him, not for something you want, but that somehow God might come again and breathe. You see, the answer to America tonight is not in the White House, forget it. The answer to America is in God's house. There was another man by the name of Payson. I like to alliterate that and say he was praying Payson of Portland. He was a man who, when they prepared him for his casket, they discovered he had some hoofs on his knees. Tradition says that James, the apostle, had calluses on his knees with prayer. Payson had the same thing. In fact, before luxury came and we got so soft, he... he slept in a bedroom that had no covering on the floor. It had a hard floor like this. And at the side of his bed, they found two grooves. Two places that were worn six or seven inches long and deep, and uh, they wondered why they were at the side of his bed. And then somebody said this was the place where he always prayed. And actually, he had plowed two grooves in the floor of his bedroom in his intercession. He was a little Scotsman. He lived a few miles north of Chicago on the border of the lake. And I got to see him for about ten minutes. He began to thank me for the books I'd written, particularly on prayer, and uh, I, I hushed him and said, no, the honor is, is the other way. I'm honored to see you. Well, they carried him out of his little house on the 9th of February this year, and would you believe it, it was the first time he'd been out of the house in twelve and a half years never been out of the door of his own house in twelve and a half years never been to bed one night for thirty years this isn't back in Finney's day or in the days of the when they were breaking the frontier here this, this is in our day, in your day, in my day just a few months ago of course they didn't put his picture on the front of Time magazine if they did I'd have objected to it anyhow but this little man learned the art of intercession. He prayed every night from ten at night until five or six in the morning whenever the burden lifted. Now somebody will ask me the question, did he sleep? Well, what do you think he was? Of course he slept. But he learned to do what the hymn writer says in that hymn, work for the night is coming, give every flying minute something to keep in store. He pushed the day around. In case you don't know, there are 24 hours in it. They're divided into three eights. Normally, you work eight, you sleep eight. What do you do with the other eight? On the same basis, you live 60 years, you work 20, you sleep 20, and what do you do with the other 20? 
One of the hymn writers says, I often say my prayers, but do I ever pray? Like the little boy went to church with his daddy, his daddy bowed his head, did this, and the little fellow said, what did you, what did you say? He said, shut up. <laughs> because he couldn't remember, never mind the Lord. Therefore, pray. Always pray. I've said this often, and it's got me into trouble, but I'm still going to say it anyhow. I'm quite sure of this, that no man... I don't care how large his church, I don't care how many books he's written, how far he's traveled. I do not believe that any man or woman is greater than their prayer life. If you learn this lesson while you're young, you younger folk, you know nobody can impress God. Ever thought about that? The Spirit of God descended on a bunch of people at Hernhut in Germany. Do you know... That, in one sense, is, 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 is a more wonderful miracle than Pentecost in this sense. That, do you know how long that prayer meeting lasted? It started at precisely 11 o'clock that Wednesday morning on the 13th of August, 1727. And do you know what? It lasted 100 years without stopping. That prayer room was never empty for 100 years. Little boys and girls, seven and eight years of age, would groan and travail in birth for revival. <laughs> don't go out and say like people say, well, I've made up my mind I'm going to pray four hours a day after this. Why don't you make your mind up you're running the Olympics tomorrow? There was much chance. You don't change overnight. We approximate to it. We, we, we get our muscles stronger and stronger in the place of prayer. You get to the place where you'd rather sweat, you'd rather weep in his presence than laugh in anybody else's presence. You'd rather God whisper a secret into your heart that breaks you. And somebody give you the prizes that all the world covets. I don't think I ever go to a prayer meeting for what I pray one simple prayer amongst others. And that is, Lord, teach us to pray.